You know, on this Mother's Day, I'd like to speak on two women. One was a wife, a mother, and a mother-in-law. The other was a Gentile woman who married an Israelite, but her story takes a lot of twists and turns. Before we go into that, let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would bring the word alive to us. I pray, Lord, that you would minister strength and faith and courage. I pray that you would bless your people, and especially all the mothers and grandmothers, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. I don't know if you guessed who I'm talking about, but I'm speaking about Naomi and Ruth. And I've entitled my message, More Than a Mother-in-Law. Now, we always talk about mothers, and this is truly Mother's Day. But did you know in the U.S., the last Sunday of October, the fourth Sunday of October is Mother-in-Law's Day? Did you know that? And really, nobody ever brought it up. And nobody celebrated it. I wonder why. But let me see, if you are a mother-in-law, you have a son or daughter who is married, may I just see your hand? You're a mother-in-law. May I ask all the mother-in-laws to stand, please? All the mother-in-laws. Wow. Wow. Come on, give all these mother-in-laws a big hand. Please be seated. Please be seated. This is wonderful. Now, we are looking, we will be looking into all the four chapters of the book of Ruth as we study about these two women. It's a beautiful story between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. Talking of mother-in-law, uh, you know, generally we hear about the tension between a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law or son-in-law. Especially if they are staying under the same roof. A young man who is married is generally caught between two wonderful ladies in his life. And I would say a daughter also, also, also caught between two wonderful people. Now, a man is caught between two wonderful ladies and he is sandwiched right there. If he turns to this side, this side hurts. If he turns to this side, this side hurts. You probably heard a lot of jokes on mother-in-law. I heard an office executive going to his boss and say, Sir, can I have a day off next week to visit my mother-in-law? And the boss said, certainly not. And the man said, thank you so much, sir. I knew you would be understanding. <laughs> I heard about this young man who brought his dog to the veterinary doctor and said, can you please cut my dog's tail off? The vet, the doctor examined the uh, dog and said, you know, there is no problem with the tail. There is no... He says, why do you want to cut the tail? He says... My mother-in-law is coming next week and I don't want anything in the house that shows that she is welcome. The dog will wag the tail, you know. I heard, a, heard another one. Now, this is just jokes. It's this, this is just humor. Is that all right? All right. Nothing about anybody, but just fun. A man in New York was leaving a convenience store with a coffee in his hand, a cup of coffee, when he noticed a most unusual funeral procession approaching a nearby cemetery. A black hearse was followed by a second black hearse about 50 feet behind the first one. Behind the second hearse was a solitary man walking with a dog on a leash. Behind him, a short distance back, were almost 200 men walking in a single line, a single file. Now, this man with the coffee didn't understand what was going on. He respectfully approached this man who was walking with the dog, says, I'm so sorry for your loss. And it's a bad time to disturb you, but I've never seen a funeral like this. Whose funeral is it? The man replied, it's my wife's. Oh, what happened to her? He said, my dog attacked and killed her. Oh, that was bad. But what about the second hearse? Oh, that's my mother-in-law. She was trying to help my wife when the dog turned on her and attacked her and killed her. There was silence. And he says, I'm so sorry. May I, 
make a request can i borrow your dog please <laughs> the man replied please get in line <laughs> we hear not so good things about mother in laws and i feel bad about it toxic kind of mother in laws and strong mother in laws those who control remote control or demanding manipulative or selfish ones but i need to tell you there are very loving ones too they are considerate kind godly mothers i personally have been blessed by a wonderful mother in law she is a godly woman a prayerful woman and she has been a strong pillar in her house most of all she has influenced my wife to be a godly woman an incredible wife a caring daughter in law and a very committed mother i think the credit goes to my mother in law now the story that i'm talking about is from the book of ruth there are two books in the bible that are named after women they are ruth and esther now if you notice ruth was a gentile woman who was who married an israelite but esther was a jewish woman who married a gentile though the book of ruth begins on a very gloomy note we see the divine hand of god guiding couple of ladies in deep distress i want to talk to you from four chapters and each chapter is going to be a beautiful insight are you ready for the study if you have notes please write it down In chapter 1 we find running away from a famine there's trouble and tragedy everywhere Ruth chapter 1 verse 1 in the days when judges ruled there was a famine in the land so a man from Bethlehem in Judah together with his wife and two sons went to live for a while in the country of Moab the man's name was Elimelech his wife's name was Naomi and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion they were Ephrathites of from Bethlehem Judah and they went to Moab and lived there Now Elimelech Naomi's husband died and she was left with her two sons they married Moabite women one named Orpa and the other was Ruth after they had lived there about 10 years both Malon and Kilion also died and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband i mean look at the trouble that has come and i can see five different kinds of trouble number one there are of course famine in the land They they were from Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. Can you believe there was no bread in the house of bread? There's no food in the house of bread. And so these people decided they're going to leave their country. They're going to leave their place and go to some place. Now, I know many people love to migrate to different countries. There is trouble. Now, uh, uh Elimelech and Naomi were not the only couple going through famine. There were so many other couples and there were hundreds and thousands of families in Bethlehem, Judah or in Israel that went through this difficulty. But these people decided to move. But where did they go? They went to Moab. Moab was a cursed place. It was a cursed group of people. So the first thing you find is famine. Number two, the trouble... that they have gone through is settling down in moab moab resulted from an incestuous relationship between lot and his daughter people were generally uh, you, you can see that lot did this and later you find that uh, one of the prophets the king of moab called one of the prophets to go and curse the land of israel you remember they were cursed to the 10th generation and elimelech actually decided to go to moab and live there in a godless place in a pagan place and exposing his wife and kids to a pagan culture pagan gods godlessness the gods of the land were chemosh chemosh actually received little babies in sacrifice burnt sacrifice little girls were exposed to, uh, uh, to for the fertility god and they were abused by men in the temple they ended up paying a huge price for their immigration they gained few things they gained food but they lost few things too you see sometimes we gain education when you go far away 
but we lose our culture. We gain a broader perspective, but lose our marriages. We gain money, but end up losing values. We gain a big house, but end up losing a family. The third trouble is the death of Elimelech. The man of the house died. Naomi were left with her two sons in a faraway place, in a foreign land, with no relatives, no support system, nobody around. She was left in a foreign land with two sons and husband gone. Trouble four, her sons marry ungodly women, Gentile women. They married Moabite women. They were Gentiles, unsaved, unredeemed. They were influenced by a pagan culture, religion and their gods. One was Orpah, the other was Ruth, and they were married for 10 years. Trouble five, both her sons die. Both her sons die at the peak of their life, the peak of their youth. Almost feels like a premature death. Trouble after trouble. It almost feels like they were going from the frying pan into the fire. Now you can see these three women. Three weeping widows. Hopeless, helpless, with no support from families, in a foreign land, with no jobs, no future. Everything was bleak. Friends, let me ask you, as God's people, do you go through trouble? When you go through trouble, where do you go? What do you do? You may go through a famine in terms of finances. Famine regarding your job. You probably lost your job. Famine regarding other challenges that you're going through. Ruth asked both of her daughters to go back to her parents and go back to marrying again. Orpah agreed and returned to her parents, but Ruth clung to her mother-in-law. In verse 16 and 17, Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I'll be buried. Right here, Ruth confesses her faith in the God of Israel. She said, your God will be my God. Orpah went back to her people and her gods. But Ruth, and you know what? God up in heaven saw the determination of a young widow's life and he decided to move. God is moved by our faith. And then they heard that, that God had visited Bethlehem so they returned back. In chapter 2, we find Ruth in Boaz's field. You know, it's wonderful to see how God orchestrates things. In Bethlehem, we find the two women come, two widows come. There's no hope, no job, no money, no men to support, no protection, struggling. Ruth tells her mother-in-law, I'm going to go and work. Go and work in the fields and get some grain. And you can notice, you can see the hand of God. Friends, when you are in trouble, remember... If you can reach out to God, he will never abandon you. They that looked unto him were never put to shame. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. Amen. They that looked unto him were never put to shame. When you're in trouble, remember to look up. Lift up your head, eyes. Oh, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the one whom the maker of heaven and earth. He will not sleep. He will not slumber. The God of Israel never slumbers nor sleeps. Amen. Amen. Friends, if you're in trouble, lift your eyes up. There is a God up in heaven who not only watch Ruth, he's watching you. And he's there to help you. Many times we run from pillar to post. We run from one person to another. We run from one bank to another. And I need to say, there is a God who will help us. God divinely orchestrated the events in Ruth's life. And he will do that in your life. If you can put your faith in him. Of all the people that had lands, that had fields and that had harvest. Ruth found herself working in the land of Boaz. A near kinsman redeemer. God brought Ruth to Boaz's land. She did not know anything about the man, but God did. 
Now, Boaz showed this foreigner, this widow, unusual kindness and helped. In chapter 3, are you, are you ready for this? Turn to your neighbor and say, it's getting exciting. It's getting exciting. Turn to your neighbor. It's getting ex- Now, chapter 3, mothers and mother-in-law, listen very carefully. Chapter 3, we find Ruth at Boaz's feet. Are you ready for this? Okay, Ruth chapter 1. Uh, Ruth chapter 3. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter. She didn't say my daughter-in-law. My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be at the winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Everybody read verse 3, please. Let's read verse 3. Does it, is it there? Verse 3. Verse 3. Ruth chapter 3, verse 3, LCD. Okay, right, here we go. Let's, let's see, read it. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating. Verse 5. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. She went down. You know, in chapter 3, Naomi's deep concern for her daughter-in-law. She says, I must find a home for you. I must find a home for you. I know many mothers are concerned for your sons and daughters. You're concerned that they would find a home. What counsel do you give them? Mothers, let me ask you, what counsel do you give your daughters? Some will tell the daughters to study, which is a wonderful thing. Go and study. One degree after another. To find a job, to climb the corporate ladder. We tell our daughters to be a leader, to be independent, to be financially stable, to know how to independently manage your life, to be proactive. You know, these qualities are wonderful. But Ruth, uh, Naomi gave Ruth a different kind of advice. And it's very interesting. You see, Naomi was married for many years and she knew exactly what men were looking for. Are you listening to me? It's the first service. It's the first service. It's the first service. Are you listening? Okay. Naomi is giving a very different kind of advice because she knew what men were looking for. And remember, just like in India, those people also had arranged marriages. They had proposals. They had arranged marriages. But listen to the wise counsel of Naomi. She challenged Ruth to do four things in preparation, in personal preparation as you look forward for marriage. Young ladies, if you were to do these four things, it will add to all the other things qualification you have. Are you ready for it? It will help you find a handsome young man. And all the ladies say amen. Chalta First advice, wash yourself. You say, well, pastor, that's it. What it means is be clean. Ladies, look sharp. Be clean. Look fresh. You are lo- you're really thinking of marriage. You're looking like an old grandmother like this, you know, just walking. Around. Who wants an old grandmother type man? Look sharp. Wash yourself. Pastor, I wash, Pastor. <laughs> Look clean. Look attractive. I know it's arranged marriages. And in arranged marriages, you need the degree and the dowry and all of that kind of stuff. But men are looking for something. Men are visual creatures. Ladies, say this with me. Men are visual creatures. They are not hearing what you're saying. They are watching you. Amen? And all the men say amen. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for supporting me. I kind of felt lonely, you know. (laughs) Men are watching. You know, have you seen men would be talking to a group of friends and suddenly a pretty lady goes and he'll go like this. (laughs) And if it's a wife, he's in trouble. 
He's in trouble. Don't blame him. He is a visual creature. Wash yourself. Naomi knows if you are ever going to find a man, you better be a clean person. Ladies, I also want to say, after marriage also, wash yourself. <laughs> Keep yourself clean. When your husband comes home, look fresh. Look fresh. Number two, put on perfume. Smell nicely. Men also love smell. Are you with me? I mean, if you're cooking your favorite curry, he comes to the door, he's already feeling romantic. <laughs> just smelling the chicken. Just smelling the gongura chicken or whatever, right? Or mutton, whatever. But smell is very important when it comes to a man. Are you with me? Ladies, purchase a perfume. Go ahead, invest. Invest. Now, I know some ladies like to put a lot of flowers on top of their head. That's okay, but by the end of the day, the flower is not smelling that fresh. Are you with me? I think if you have to choose between flower and perfume, go ahead and invest in a perfume. Smell good. Am I preaching too harsh? Is it okay? Is it good? Now, don't smell your neighbor now. Give them time. Amen. Number three, put on your dress, dress yourself in your best clothes. Again, you're working on his, he's a visual creature, remember. He's a visual creature. So if you are ever thinking of getting married, put on your best clothes. At least Sunday morning, Baba. Put on, look attractive. It is so important. See, one of the tragedies of arranged marriages, we feel like it doesn't matter how I look, what size I look, how I smell, how I put my hair, some proposal will come, pay him for 15, 20 lakhs, get married, and then... No, don't do that. The world is changing. Look, look at the corporate industry. Look at the hospitality industry. They will not take people that doesn't look sharp. Ladies, are you with me? You, you worked in an airline, isn't it? Which one? Indian, Indian Airlines and also... You were in jet also? Were you in jet? Indian Airlines? They look for sharpness, right? Right. Airline industry? Hotel industry? Why should a godly man get anything less? Amen. Look sharp. But the fourth thing I want you to know... Fourth thing is, and then go down. Now that is difficult, especially if you're a leader, to go down. What you are saying is, humble yourself. You know, marriages can go very well if it is between two humble people. People who doesn't have too much ego can have a wonderful marriage. If you're already feeling too great and mighty and how great thou art, it's a terrible marriage. Amen? Because you're not ready to give up. You're not ready to say, I'm sorry. You're not ready to go down. But marriage will require you to go down so many times. Are you with me? Be willing to go down if you're looking for a man. It is so vital. For, uh, friends, I want to ask you, what counsel do you give your daughters? The mother-in-law says, go down, find the spot where he is, and lay near his feet. And when he will come, he will find out, tell him. You know, now I know some handsome people are really hoping that will happen, that the lady will come to your feet. And it is not going to happen. I guarantee you it will not happen. Amen? So don't expect that part of the scripture. But what I want to say is this. She goes and says, you are my nearest kinsman. I want you to redeem me. You know, what she did was very risky. What she did was very risky because she could have been uh, thought of as somebody is trying to solicit this man for a quick relationship. Or to, to give some kind of a sexual favor. She could have been misunderstood. 
But she took a risk. She went there. And the man was honorable. And says, you go home before anybody sees. And take this, take this goods with you. She took a bag full of goodies to her mother. Don't go to your mother-in-law empty-handed, he said. That's a good advice. Are you listening to me? All the husbands, are you listening to me? Don't go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Take something. At least a box of chocolates. Take something. Do something for their mother-in-law. And when she goes back, the mother-in-law asks a very important question. Now, in the NIV and KJV, it is translated differently. Okay? In the, in the NIV, I think it says, how, how did it go, my daughter? But the actual translation is, who are you, my daughter? The actual translation, the, the actual question that Naomi asked was, when, Naomi, uh, when Ruth comes back, and Naomi looks at her and says, who are you, my daughter? In other words, tell me what happened as a result of all your personal preparation. Who are you? Are you the prospective wife of Boaz? Did he agree? Did he agree? Did everything go well? Proposal finalized? It's very strange because a woman is proposing to the man. But you see, she was more desperate. If you notice in the scripture, Boaz was a much older man. Boaz was much older. And she was young. She had choice. But she was smart enough. She knew the roles. She knew she, she is a widow and she needed to marry somebody from within the family. And she also knew Boaz was established. He was wealthy. He had lands. He had servants. He was able to support women. You need to be smart when you're looking for a man. Don't look for somebody who's not having a job. Not able to stand on his own feet. No, no. You're going to have many years of being in debt. Find men who are spiritually strong. And who has a job. And who's able to manage himself and can manage you. Let me go on to ask another. This is, I'm digressing from my... Uh, my... Uh, Naomi said another one thing. She said, the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Naomi knew one thing. If a man likes a woman, he will not keep quiet. Are you listening to this, ladies? Now, if a man is showing interest in you, don't throw an attitude. Ah, no, I'm not going to talk. Some ladies do that. It's very stupid of them to do that. After much effort, the man is trying to show some interest. If he's a good godly man, go to God in prayer. Even without talking anything, go to God and say, God, is that the man for me? Why don't you take it up with the Lord? Take it up with your family. Take, go to your parents and check. And the Lord will guide you. Your, fam, uh, your family will counsel you. Let me digress. Is that okay? And ask you another question. From this passage, is it okay for a young widow or a widower to remarry? I know in our culture, we kind of look at it very differently. We don't quite accept it. We actually, though we are Christians, we carry a little bit of the Hindu mindset. Because according to the Hindu mindset, if the husband dies... You stay a widow the rest of your life. Oh, like the old times, they jump into the funeral pyre of the husband. Sati, you remember Sati? Friends, but you are redeemed and you are born again and things are different. And you and I know our marriage is not forever and eternal. No. Our marriage has a shelf life until one of you go to heaven. Amen? Our marriages have a shelf life. You and I are there until parted by death. What if a spouse passes away early? I remember when my brother died, one of the counsel I gave my sister-in-law was, listen, you are 21, or maybe 22 at that time. And I told her, you need to get married again. 
I'm so glad she did. She has three kids now. She settled. I guess she was trying to compete with me. That's all right. But what I want to say is this. How do you respond to somebody? I know here in our church where people have got very upset because either the son-in-law or the son or the daughter or daughter-in-law remarried because their spouse died. Friends, that is not right. We cannot have a bad attitude. Let, let's go and see. Instead of our culture, let's go and find out what the Bible has to say. Are you ready for this? First Timothy, please turn with me and I want the LED team to put it up, please. First Timothy 5, verse 9. <clears throat> no widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60 and has been faithful to her husband and is well known for her good deeds such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. Verse 11. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. Don't put them on the list of widows. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into a habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. Verse 14. Let's read verse 14 together. Shall we read together? Everyone, everyone reading. Here we go. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have in fact turned away to follow Satan. Let's go to Titus chapter 2, verse 3 to 5. Titus chapter 2. So the scripture really encourages widows to remarry. And as a pastor, I want to encourage you, friends. If your spouse has gone to heaven, we encourage you to remarry a godly partner. A godly, committed, born-again partner. Because this world is a very difficult place to live a lonely life. This Titus chapter 2, verse 3 to 5. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live lives, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine. Ladies, don't drink. That's what it says. But to teach what is good. Verse 4. Shall we read verse 4 and 5 together, please? Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Friends, if you are a wife, your primary responsibility is to your family. Then comes your job and everything else. Young ladies, I want to say this. If you are bent upon a career and you have no time for family, I plead with you, don't get married. It's perfectly okay not to be married. Because marriage will demand time and priority. The husband is required by the scriptures to go and provide for the home, to find a job. In chapter 4, we find Ruth in Boaz's family. So after doing this, he says, you go home. He says, you know, I need to tell you, there is somebody else who has more right than me. So he has a first preference. So the next morning, immediately this guy goes and he calls all the elders and calls this man. And he has a meeting and he says, hey, we have this place. And you are the one who is supposed to redeem it. So if you are willing to redeem it, go ahead. And he got excited. He says, yes, I will redeem the place. He said, but there is a catch. When you redeem the place, you also obtain the dead man's widow. And suddenly the man said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. 
So he said, okay, well, if you don't do it, the next chance comes to me. I will do it, Boaz said. So in front of all the elders, he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to purchase all the land that belongs to Elimelech, to Malon and Kilion. All the three. And I will marry Ruth, Malon's wife, as my wife. So Boaz did that. You see, I want you to see the story. It goes from a famine to field, to his feet, to the family. Are you with me? It's so beautiful when you see. And right now, she is part of a family. I'm not reading the scripture for lack of time. You can read that in chapter 4. Let me go down, please. Verse 13, chapter 4. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. What an incredible divine provision by the Lord. For somebody who said, your people are my people. Where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. You are a Gentile. You are a curse group. But you have become into the very family of God because you put your faith in the Lord. Friends, from hopelessness to hope, to mourning to joy, from nothing to possessing all things, from poverty to riches, from barrenness to becoming a mother. Remember, Ruth was married for 10 years. She didn't have a child. Now she has one. Now she has one. I love the story of Ruth. I believe Ruth and Naomi can sing a song. I believe we sang this morning. He has turned my mourning into dancing. He has turned my sorrow into joy. What a blessed mother-in-law. Did you know Ruth had two mothers-in-law? Did you realize that? And Boaz had none. But Naomi was more than a mother-in-law. She actually graduated from a mother-in-law by her care, by her dedication, by her counsel, by her guidance into the very role of a mother. <coughs> Naomi in the natural had no sons to carry on her name or her family. But God changed everything. Everybody exclaimed, Naomi has a son. Amen. Look at the genealogy. Chapter 4 verse 21. Salmon the father of Boaz. Boaz the father of Obed. Obed the father of Jesse. And Jesse the father of David. But I want you to notice something else. Naomi had a very bad past. And she was redeemed into the family. There is another woman... That is not listed in Ruth. But I want you to see had a similar story. It's found in Matthew chapter 1 verse 5. When you read about Boaz, it says, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Are you listening? We hear about Rahab the prostitute in the book of Judges, right? Rahab the prostitute, do you remember? Boaz's mother was Rahab the prostitute. She also comes from a place where there is no hope. There's no future. A terrible name, a bad testimony. But because of the scarlet thread that she put outside the window and because of the scarlet thread and the blood of the lamb upon her life, she was redeemed. And she also got included into the very family of David and into the family of Jesus. My friend, if you put your faith in the Lord, what an incredible story of three women. Hopeless situation. Out of the league. And yet God in his mercy. And because of their faith. Brought them into the league. What an incredible. Mother-in-law. Mothers-in-law too. Ruth had two incredible mothers-in-law. Naomi and Rahab. My friend. 
what a mother happy mothers day i want all the mothers to stand please all the mothers to stand all the grandmothers to stand and i'm going to call the worship team to please come all the mothers mothers in law to stand i'm going to ask also something else i'm going to ask all the married ladies to stand especially if you're believing the lord for a miracle of a child i want you to stand because god is going to go amen on this day just like you heard the testimony of our dear sister both the sisters god is able to provide a miracle today so i want you to lift your hands will you do that father god i pray for all the mothers and the mothers in law and the grandmothers and the wives here father god i pray your richest blessings upon them dear lord you know the challenges they go through you know the times when they run out of patience you know the times when they struggle lord in their mothering you they will struggle lord in managing a home in playing the role of a wife a a, a mother a daughter in law and and a mother in law lord the various roles they play and also lord many of them that are in jobs and having to manage an office and i manage a home god we pray for grace supernatural grace we pray lord for all these ladies that they would have wonderful men that will support them and encourage them they will have godly home they will raise their children lord to be men and women of god father i pray for the mothers that are praying for marriages for their own daughters and sons god i pray that you would help them to counsel and guide them that every one of them will find a godly companion we pray lord for those ladies who are married and seeking you for a child in the name of jesus just like you did in the life of ruth oh god that you will lord perform a miracle today in the lives of these ladies seeking you for a miracle of a child in jesus name lord we release that miracle upon those ladies lord that they will testify next mothers day what the good lord has done lord we worship you we praise you we thank you lord in jesus name amen amen